Hey guys, welcome back to Mo's Game Table. Uh, today we're going to do an unboxing of Heroes of the Pacific from Lock and Load Publishing in the Lock and Load Tactical series. This obviously deals with the uh, struggle in the Pacific and a really evocative cover. Uh, I love the look of pretty much all of uh, Lock and Load's covers, but this one is uh, really cool and I have a special place in my heart for anything that deals with the Marine Corps. So. Uh, it's not just the Marines though, they are going to have Army in this as well from what I read on the back and what it says here is it's described as uh, Heroes of the Pacific details America's brawl with Japan and frantic firefights from the audacious island hopping campaign. Lead desperate Marines struggling ashore on Tarawa face a counterattack in Hago tanks at Peleliu Island, fight for Katano Point and Iwo Jima and more. So there's plenty of uh, good action here if you're a, a World War II Pacific Theater fan. There's not a lot of love out there for the Pacific Theater. There's a ton for the ETO, uh, both, both the East and the West Fronts, but uh, not as much for the Pacific. But this is your answer if you're looking for that in the Lock and Load Tactical Series. So we're going to open it up and great little vacuum. And you guys don't get to enjoy it, but like I said in my last video, you can smell that cardboard at least I can so we start off we got paradise white and red we've got the module rules so we'll hit those up first and in this we have your standard national characteristics and <clears throat> excuse me module specific rules only a few of them in this one and then the Scenarios here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve scenarios uh, overall. And it starts with uh, the scenario rules the Japanese 50 millimeter mortar, which was the knee mortar, uh, nice squad weapon, easily transportable, can wreak a lot of havoc. And the Japanese stick bomb, this is uh, used in close assault. Uh, melee or close assault and close assault it is used as an anti-tank weapon so something to bear in mind when you're bringing in those US tanks um, all nationalities can lay smoke Japanese forces their national characteristics um, the US or Japanese forces respond to casualties differently from other forces they use a new uh, direct fire table in the players aid which we'll take a look at here in a little bit uh, if a step reduction or shaken result is received during movement, the affected units must stop moving in the hex where they receive the result. Exception for that is bonsai movement. Um, a leader or sniper that receives a shaken or wounded result is wounded. Japanese leaders don't shake, exception the armor leader. Japanese armor leader shake and rally as per 11.5. Um, everybody else, it appears, shakes normally. Um, Japanese squads cannot voluntarily break in half squads or remnants. Uh, Japanese heroes. The Japanese do not generate heroes. Unlike the US and pretty much every side in the Lock and Load Tactical series, uh, these guys do not generate heroes. Uh, the reason being here is it says the courage represented by their method of squad reduction in addition to ninjutsu and bonsai movement exemplifies a country's warrior ethos. The Japanese were not about individual heroism. They were devoted to supporting their idea of the greater good. So that explains why there is no Japanese heroes. You do have Japanese snipers. They don't shake, as we talked about before, but they can be wounded. Um, Japanese player places Japanese sniper in kunai grass, heavy jungle, light jungle, brush, clear road, or hill terrain. And you can also place a spider hole with the sniper. Spider holes provide following benefit after seeing the attacker's die roll and before rolling his own. The Japanese player can ask the enemy player to re-roll his direct fire roll or his ordnance fire roll when attacking a spider hole. Japanese player must accept the second roll, so that's pretty neat. A little bit of a, a benefit to the Japanese sniper there. Create a lot of chaos and be able to maybe avoid retaliation by the U.S. Bonsai attacks... Uh, only Japanese can conduct bonsai attacks if the leader is not, if it's basically a good order leader, 
they can initiate a bonsai attack as the first action of their impulse if he is within six movement points, not hexes. So six movement points with jungle terrain, that's going to eat up a lot of your movement points. So you're going to have to be relatively close. Um, and it must be a spotted enemy occupied hex and only multi-man counters and other leaders likewise unmarked uh, that are not activated are eligible to participate in the bonsai attack. You can The leader can perform a spotting prior to that, it says here, so uh, it's a pretty powerful um, attack. should be interesting to see that in action. Ninjutsu movement, um, being that the Japanese were excellent jungle fighters and adept at ambushing their enemies, ninjutsu movement replicates the ability um, without the awkward mechanics of hidden movement. When a scenario states that units enter as per rules of ninjutsu movement, the Japanese player places them as follows. The units can be placed at any time, whether it is the Japanese player's impulse or the opposing player's impulse. Uh, placement of the units cannot exceed stacking limits. The target hex must have a target modifier equal or equal to or greater than one after the Japanese player identifies which units he will attempt to place and in which hex he will attempt to place them. It rolls 1d6 and consults the table below. On a die roll of 0, 1, 2, uh, Japanese units eliminated, 3 place the unit in an adjacent hex of Japanese player choice and 4, 5, and 6 is placed in the hex. And yes, you can get a 0 on a d6 because there are modifiers. So as it's set up here, if there is a, it needs to have a, a 1 or better target modifier hex. If you had a, a 1 target modifier, this, if there's an enemy MMC in the hex, would negate that. So that's how you would get the 0. So that explains that. Um, then after placement, the Japanese player must melee enemy units that are in the same hex. Um, and there goes on to explain a little bit more about not being able to participate in a melee that's been conducted already and so on and so forth. Then you have Marine Assault Teams. Here we go to the U.S. Forces. Marine Assault Teams, uh, there are 324 units. They um, can expend three movement points when assault moving, uh, four if using DT movement and still fire. When using assault movement as assault teams only suffer a negative one FP penalty. So they only lose one on their firepower. Um, they cannot be op fired on in the first hex in which they enter the enemy's LOS unless they are adjacent to the enemy. So if you try moving up adjacent um, and think that you're going to get past or not, you're going to get, uh, you'll get that one movement, but any follow-on hexes that you move through there are going to be open you up to op fire. Um, then you have U.S. Army Rifle Squads um, and the LVT-4s. Crews don't abandon them. They're open top vehicles and can be targeted by enemy small arms fire. And then of course you have bombers. You have the G4M Betty. It attacks with an FP of 8 and the 6 adjacent hexes with an FP of 4. So it's half strength on the, it's, it's full strength on the initial target and then the supporting hexes get a 4 FP. Uh, there's star shells in this as there are in others. There's bunkers, caves, uh, tunnel movement, collapsed entrances. So there's also emplacement. So quite a bit there. So let's take a quick breeze through these scenarios here. We've got uh, Raid on Taibu and Guadalcanal, US, the, the Marine Corps and the Japanese, and then Guadalcanal again. And this time it's the Army, 164th Infantry, against the Sendai Division of the Japanese 29th Infantry. And Guadalcanal, one more. This one is again the Infantry, 132nd Infantry against the Japanese 2nd Infantry Division. And then we have Tarawa and 2nd Marine Division. You get a Wildcat Strike, and you'll be facing off against the Special Naval Landing Force, which a lot of people consider the Japanese Marines, but technically they weren't. Uh, they were just a Special Naval Landing Force, but soldiers from the sea, I guess you could still consider the Marines. Uh, if you wanted to. Uh, 
we're at Tarawa Atoll again here with the six Marines and the SNLF and Dutch New Guinea. And that's the Army against the Japanese, Saipan, the Marines against Japanese, Peleliu, the Marines against the Japanese, and again on uh, Peleliu, and Nishi and the Iwo, and we're in Okinawa now, towards the end of the war. Uh, <laughs> I got a kick out of this one. I want to take that ridge. And yeah, you may think Wana is misspelled if you don't know about Okinawa, but Wana Ridge is in Okinawa. Um, pretty clever name for a scenario. So that's the module rules, and you have the core rules manual, which everybody already knows about. If you have played Lakamo Tactical, you know that rule manual pretty well already. And we've got counters, we've got some maps, and we've got plenty of player aid cards, as we tend to have in the tactical series you need them these these are really well done these are great i love this giant fold out uh style of player a card it really makes it easier to just lay them out re uh, reference them and read across you don't have to squish as much information and you can you don't have to have a hard time reading it because there's notes that go along with different um, aspects of the terrain and on the other side you've got your dft table for the U.S. and the Japanese, they actually have two separate, and the Ordnance Fire Table, of course, as well. And then you have your sequence of play and your weapons and ammo targets. Uh, if you've uh, played tactical before, you got John Wayne up here to oversee that and make sure that you know what you're doing. Sergeant Stryker. Um, and, yes, he is Sergeant Stryker. So, good uh, call out to... Sands of Iwo Jima, if you've not seen it. If you've not seen it and you're a Wargamer, shame on you. Anyway, back to this. we got sequence play. I like how this is laid out. You know, it gives you the, a nice breakdown to, to remind you of what everything uh, is for each procedure. And then the section of the rules that you can reference if you're not sure on. Uh, skill reference cards, we have five, uh, 11 skills overall. And... That is for your heroes and any that may be assigned in the scenario. And then you have your rule reference card that breaks down everything that you need, as well as the uh, which this here. If you're if you're not familiar with lock and load tactical, it may seem like a bunch of gobbledygook, but this uh, legend really does help you break things down and understand it. At first, you're going to be referencing the rules, but once you've uh, picked up the rule, this is all you really need. It's uh, a good way of laying things out. And of course, there's your uh, turn track and victory point markers as well. Really like that style. And let's take a quick look here before we go to the counters. At the maps, there are three, four, five of them. And of course, as you'd expect, You've got heavy and light jungle. You've got some villages, uh, some hamlets, and as well as some buildings. And there's a closer look at the jungle here. And then we've got a hill here. And this will probably be one a ridge, I would assume, for that scenario. And then for the Times when you need to storm the beach, you have your beach map that you can use. It's like all these other maps, or everything's geomorphic and works well together. And you can make up your own scenarios or use the ones that are supplied. So these are the standard um, administrative counters that you normally get uh, with Lock and Load Tactical. There's some new ones here. Bonsai is new in Tunnel for the Tunnel. And what else? Uh, I'm trying to see what else I can pick up. Caves. Um, and of course, your Rex and Turn Initiative marker. Uh, all that is in there. And then, of course, you have your Mines and the Open, which I'm not a big fan of uh, using the Open um, or Closed, uh, Buttoned Up or Open Turret for Tanks. Uh, 
tanker is generally going to be unbuttoned. The only time you button them really is if you're undergoing a gas attack or NBC attack or um, artillery, airstrike, things like that. Other than that, you're going to stay open because you need situational awareness to look around. So that's one of those rules I don't like messing with. Here's the U.S. counters. Uh, nice. I like that, that tone of green used for them. And, and as you can see, these leader counters, uh, let's see, here's the leaders here. Really excellent graphics. And we've got seven different leaders for the U.S. There's five up here, two more down here. You've got some weapons teams, um, the Wildcats, several different tanks. You've got uh, M5s, M4s, M10s, and oh, I'm sorry, there's nine. I didn't see these leaders over here. And that's going to be five for the five for the Army. That's the red star up here, and then for the Marines, there's going to be four for the Marines. Uh, the Marines counters start from about here and then all the way down and then up top this is the Army. The, red, uh, the White Star is the Army, the Eagle Globe and Anchor, Gold Eagle Globe and Anchor is the Marine Corps. So that's the Marine counters. Now let's uh, take a look at the Japanese counters. Oops, and I just knocked one out. And this guy's trying to get away from duty, which is very much against his commander's wishes. So we're going to put him back in formation real quick. That is the great thing about these. They do pop out easy. That's how easy they pop out. Um, you've got four Japanese leaders, including the tank leader we talked about before, that he does get shaken. The other Japanese leaders do not. Um, and then you have your support weapons and weapons teams and Type 95 tanks um, down here as well. And these are really slick. Look at these. These are the skill counters. And I love the historical images that are that they used and, I, and the tone they use with it, like a, a sapia tone. It really does look really cool. And, uh, and then there's some events too as well. Uh, the paragraph events that are in some of the scenarios, which I did not look for them that closely. I try to ignore them until I play the scenario. But that is Lock and Load Tactical Heroes of the Pacific. Uh, not a ton of counters in this only three sheets that's that's plenty though that'll definitely uh, give you all you need to play but uh, really great presentation I love these new counters that they've uh, done nice big chunky counters rounded corners and uh, really really nice job they did with this so another great lock and load tactical game from lock and load publishing and that is heroes of the Pacific if you've not gotten it yet uh, don't hesitate to go out there, order from Lock and Load or from your local game store. And uh, there's also the Vassal modules as well that Lock and Load has put out for those who want to play online. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.